Yeah, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today to, to discuss the organizational resilience and the crisis management standards. Uh, I'm David Adams, and I work for British Standards Institution I'm based in London, and uh, my job is to work with committee members and, uh, and others to develop standards in these areas and others. I'd like to go right into the, um, the introduction of the speakers, if I may, and then we'll talk about the, uh, the way, the format of the meeting. But uh, first off, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. Now, can we, Kate, are, we, are you showing yourself there? If I just got the, a different view that I can't see you? Yep, yeah, I'm here. Lovely. Yeah. This is Kate Needham Bennett. She's EMEA, Head of Financial Services, Go To Market at Fusion Risk Management a resilient specialist based in the UK, working with organizations worldwide, exploring how they might develop their risk and resilience programs with Fusion. To date, she's been working as a practitioner in financial services firms, setting up programs for M&A, resilience, onboarding, crisis management, and operational resilience to meet the regulations. She's now focusing on how technology can help make resilience easier, quicker, and more affordable for others leaving them room to focus on innovations. Welcome, Kate, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dick. Deborah, uh, Deborah Higgins, have I, I, am I able to see your face too, please? However that works. Hello. Gotcha, yeah. can see you now, thank you. Deborah Higgins, head of the Cabinet Office Emergency Planning College. She's a background in emergency management, crisis management, resilience, and business continuity in the public and private sector in Canada and the UK. Deborah has contributed to the development of British and international standards, industry guidelines, training and qualifications. She's the incoming chair of Continuity and Resilience at BSI and is also a commissioner for the National Preparedness Commission. Wayne, Wayne Harrop. Uh, Wayne, can we see your face, please? Hi, Dave, I'm here. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Um, assistant Professor of BCM at Coventry University. He's appointed as a national chairman of the BSI Societal Security Management Committee. Uh, he's worked with 49 countries, many transnational corporations, INGOs, and public sector organizations across the EMEA and APAC, directly bolstering their organizational resilience, crisis management, BCM, cybersecurity, and physical security management systems. He's a recipient of three industry accolades and is appointed as a strategic advisor to DEFRA in the UK and SCDF in support of 10 Asian nations spanning work pack packages in disaster risk reduction, Sendai and AADMER agreements. He's a core standards developer of um, many standards, but he's pointed out a couple of here, 22361 and 65,000. So um, let's see, has Kevin Greer joined us yet? I am going to turn once I'll, I'll follow up with Kev. I know he's just he's just misplaced that um, email. No, no, I'm here. Pay attention. You are here. Well, nice to see you, Kev. Kev Breer, right on time, practice lead at ATOS, is a practitioner, CMT, crisis management team leader, and consultant for over 20 years in the risk management, digital resilience, and crisis management arenas. Prior to working in industry, he served as a police officer in the City of London Police. He has assisted in developing numerous national and international standards and is currently the chair of ISA TC309 Organizational Governance. Um, he holds an M MSc from the University of Leicester in Risk, Crisis, and Disaster Management. So thank you, Deborah, Kate, Wayne, and Kev. And Rick, last, lastly, Rick. Hi, I've left you last because what you're going, I mean, you're going to launch into your slides, okay? So that'll be the one. Okay. Rick Cudworth, a recognized leader in organizational resilience, operational readiness, and strategic risk mitigation. He's the current chair of CAR-1, so handing over soon to Deborah Higgins as uh, the next chair. Um, he's um, also a member of the Cabinet Office Behavioral Science Expert Group as part of the National Security Risk Assessment Process for the UK. He edited and contributed to the National Preparedness Commission's report, Resilience Reimagined, a practical guide for organizations, which published March 21 in collaboration with Cranfield University. 
Following a successful career as a partner at KPMG and Deloitte for over 20 years, he's established a new consultancy firm, Resilience, and that's just R-E-S-I-L-I-E-N-C, no E at the end there. So thank you all for joining joining um, me and everyone else today. And thank you for those who are, are listening and um, hopefully participating uh, very briefly. Um, because we have we have over an hour, but frankly, that time always goes by, especially when you've got two substantive standards, the OR 65,000, oh, sorry, Organizational Resilience 65,000, which is a code of practice that published I think in September, but just a couple months. So, uh, and, but uh, also the crisis management, this is a BS EN ISO 22361 and crisis management. And that just published this week. So the, the panelists have been chosen today, not only for leading their standards, but being practitioners in these fields. So very, very fortunate indeed to have you. What I would suggest is um, maybe leave your videos on and so we can see your faces. And then that way, if you wanted to say something, uh, just maybe to go like that, you can stick your hand up if you want. Um, or however, however it is that you want to be heard, uh, be heard, please an informal chat. We, we all know each other reasonably well, having been in standards for, for quite a long time, some of us and probably all of us. And so uh, we'll have some informality that uh, viewer, anybody participating may not, may not be accustomed to, but it's all friendly, all friendly here. So Rick's gonna kick us off with a few slides and talk about uh, the, the, OR, uh, the organizational resilience. Just got a few slides. Now, panelists, if you want, what I would suggest is wait until the end because there's only a few. But if there is some sort of burning uh, question, then you know I think it is okay to inject. Let's put it that way. And um, anyone listening, I think it's a Q and A that we're using, and not the chat function. And I'll, I'll, I'll did Sarah Crawford? Did you miss the start? Well, if, hopefully you're here now. It, it only started at started 11:15. We were right on time, so. Yeah, but we're we're fast and fierce. I'm just talking a little bit quickly because I want I want you to have the benefit of these people's expertise, their skills, and their experience. So after Rick does his slides, there'll be more of a general discussion. Firstly, about from the panelists. So the, I know the panelists will have questions to each other. So let's take advantage again of, of their uh, their experience and knowledge of this area. But also, I'll be monitoring the Q and A. And I'll, I'll insert the questions, uh, you know, to, as 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 best I can, and monitor it and put it in there without interrupting the flow. And then we'll have the crisis management. Now, Kev, he was a Kevin Breer, he was the convener of the crisis management. Wayne worked, you know, alongside him at European and internationally. Uh, is, so the, this is kind of pairing them up and pairing up Rick, Kate, and Deborah for the OR but the crisis management comes in the, in the second half, but it doesn't mean we can't talk about either of those standards at any point, okay? So I have some set questions that have um, been uh, prepared. So if we, if we need to, we have questions to ask that have already been submitted, but we will leave it to the panelists and the people participating to uh, strike up the questions in the conversation as you like. No, so uh, I think, did I miss anything? Is everything clear? Okay, not, not ahead and we got, thanks Wayne, that thumbs up's good. Okay, so Rick, uh, you can see the screen? I can David, yeah, thank you. Let me know when you want me to go to the next slide. I will do and thank you, thank you so much and uh, uh, welcome to everybody who's participating in this. Um, I've just got three slides, but I thought it would be helpful to give you a little bit of an intro to the new standard, um, not least because actually it is a fairly major revision to the previous version of BS 65000. The previous version was done back in, I think it was 2014. Um, it uh, was a guidance standard. It was um, quite narrative in style um, and providing, I guess, from the committee's point of view, some important thoughts about what organizational resilience is, and what it's about, on what organizations should be considering. When we came to do the revision uh, through this period, um, we've looked at a number of different um, uh, 
recent reports and papers. Uh, I've put three here as examples. First one uh, from the National Infrastructure Commission here in the UK, uh, which reports to HM Treasury in, in the UK. Uh, and it produced a report in, in on the 28th of May 2020 called Anticipate, React and Recover, which was about improving and enhancing the resilience of national infrastructure. Uh, so that was an important document uh, in, in, in our thinking. A second one that we used was uh, the work that's been going on extensively again here in the UK around operational resilience within the financial sector. Uh, the, uh, the, the documents highlighted here are um, regulatory policy now in the UK and increasingly actually uh, becoming um, regulatory policy across the world for the financial sector. And then the third, and they've referred to it a little bit earlier, Resilience Reimagined, the Practical Guide for Organisations, which was issued by the National Preparedness Commission, um, which was a report uh, researched uh, and, and involved um, over 50 organisations participating in interviews and, and workshops in, in preparing that, but really looked at you know, what are organisations currently doing to improve their, their resilience. So those three amongst others, right, provided a, what I've termed here as a growing body of evidence, but also as we looked at it, showed and highlighted increasing convergence on some of the principles and practices that would improve organ an organization's resilience. Um, and therefore as a committee, we took the opportunity to look at it and think, actually if we could move from, from a guidance standard to a go code of practice. Um, because of that body of evidence. And the code of practice gave us, has given us the opportunity not just to codify some of the um, points that are made in the reports I've referred to and other reports, but also to use the code of practice to provide some practical recommendations for organisations. So it is not just narrative, this standard. It is a, um, a, a set of recommendations within it, and I'll touch on some of that in a, in a moment. And just a final aspect, in terms of the UK's positioning here, we were very keen to get BS65000 uh, out as a code of practice. We see it as important in terms of influencing as well the international um, um, uh, perspective on, on where organisational resilience will go as an international standard in the future, as that goes through revision of two. Next slide, please, Dave. Hold on, I'm trying here. Okay, thank you. What? There it is, okay. There we go, yeah. Um, so just in terms of uh, some of the key considerations within organizational resilience and, and, you know, often what people ask is, you know, what's the difference, say, between organizational resilience and operational resilience, those types of things. The first point I'd want to bring out is the, the code of practice talks about organizational resilience across five capitals. So to be a resilient organization, you need to consider and build resilience across your five capitals and those are financial so financial resilience the built capital which is operational resilience human capital as in hu human uh, and personal resilience and then social and environmental capital which is similar to reputational resilience i guess so the five capitals gives a scoping for organizational resilience which is quite a bit broader than in the original uh, be a 65,000 guidance standard some years ago and, and absolutely tries to say to one organization all five capitals should be considered uh, and all and resilience within those five capitals should be considered as part of your organizational resilience so that's that's an important thing the second thing is Rick, Rick, excuse COVID. me yep Rick, some, I said I'd interject the five capitals has come up a couple of times a very basic question I think is why did you choose five capitals how, how did you come up with that? Why didn't you do six capitals? Or you know, trying to work, okay? <laughs> because yeah, it's a good question, Dave. So so there are existing, and you can Google, you know, five capitals model, etc. It, it it is an existing and reasonably well known sort of model, uh, and we thought rather than invent a new one, we'd look at what's already there and felt that these five capitals uh, properly summarised the. Um, aspects that should be considered as under organizational resilience. Okay, so that is why we thought we won't invent a new model, we won't invent something else or add a, a, an ever growing list um, that if an organization addresses across these five, 
and this model exists already in the world out, outside of the standard, then then it's a good good thing to do and, and adopt it. Yeah, and it came up, and thank you for that. It came up in asset management, by the way, and I understand from the discussions of the committee developing the uh, the standard that you you recognize that. So yeah, that's that was where the question yeah. uh, stemmed from because they've got they use the five capitals. Okay, thanks. Yeah, exactly. Um, just uh, very quickly on these other points, um, it encourages a whole of system review. Uh, view. So although we talk about organizational resilience, we're not talking about it within just the confines of the organization itself, but we're talking about um, how it connects to its partners, suppliers, stakeholders, etc. How it, how it, um, the context within which it operates within, um, you know, it, it, its own ecosystem, if, if you like. So it's, it's saying, take a look at the whole think about how the organization sits within the system, the wider system in which it operates, uh, and think also about how the organization contributes to the resilience of that wider system uh, as part of the organizational resilience frame. Um, a third bullet point here talks about organizational resilience as a fundamental consideration in strategy, business model design, and risk management. And I think the key point here we're making is um, it's often, uh, organizational resilience can often be seen as a risk discipline clearly it is a risk discipline but first and foremost it's also about the strategy of an organization and how it builds and operates its business model uh, because if those uh, are, aren't fundamentally right uh, risk will always struggle to uh, um, provide a, a resilient solution if you like and then finally uh, on here it talks about the defensive and progressive dimension so we talk about re organizational resilience as being both protective and responsive, but also enabling consistency and adaptation as well. So this, the code of practice touches on those. So just the final bit uh, in terms of the content of the code of practice, um, it sets some guiding principles and those guiding principles are split into two types of principle, uh, culture orientated principles. So things like we talk about foresight, insight, hindsight and oversight within that, uh, that um, section of the code. Uh, and then there are design principles. We talk about redundancy, diversity, modularity, adaptability, adaptability as the four core principles under design. So we set these, these guiding principles within the code of practice and explain what they are. Uh, then we recommend practices. And there are a number of practices recommended. I've summarized some here, but it, it, in essence, it's, uh, talking about understanding impacts on essential outcomes across each of the five capitals, understanding and setting impact thresholds. So in other words, understanding when intolerable harm or intolerable losses occur due to the impact of a, a, a disruption and using stress testing or what if scenarios to test assumptions to assess contingencies and outcome recoverability. Uh, it talks about creating an organizational resilience strategy that addresses risk anticipation, preparedness, responsiveness, recovery, and regeneration. So looking forwards and beyond. And it very much also focuses on embedding learning, governance, and reporting as part of the process of resilience within the organization. And as the final point, uh, there is, um, I think, a very useful maturity model uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the code of practice as well. Uh, and obviously there's a section around maturity and measurement of resilience within it. So, Dave, I'll hand back and we can take questions, but hopefully that's a useful summary of what the code of practice is about, where it's come from, and the sort of um, uh, material that's in it. Okay, thank, thank you, Eric. So, there's a, number of, there's a number of questions here, but first off, Kate and Deborah, as you're both very active in, in this field and with the standard, I just want to ask you both, Kate, maybe you first, uh, what's your gut reaction to this revision? went from a guidance to a code of practice for the reasons that Rick mentioned. I know you're sort of at the call face at Fusion, uh, implementing and helping organizations to uh, you know, use standardization. To what extent do you think you can use this standard? What's your gut reaction? Is it a good standard? Is it a useful standard? Are organizations gonna be able to pick this up and actually well, do something with it? I have been a little bit obliged to say, yes, it is a good standard, um, but it, it is of course a good standard. Um, it's had some really good brains behind it. Um, but it's different, I suppose, for me in that it's the code of practice aspect of it that lends itself to utility by firms. It's not um, hopefully treated 
um, as some of the ISOs are, where it's sort of become a bit of a compliance um, exercise. So you're tick boxing sometimes um, to check that you are adhering to it, its response to audit. This is a lot more um, clear in terms of its recommendations as to ideas of what you could do to implement the different guiding uh, sort of principles behind it. Um, and the focus here, as Rich Scott, Rick Scott on screen, of culture and design, I think shows that it's looking at the long term solutions and changing the whole way that your business does operate and looks at the operating model um, and isn't just a section of the business that deals with resilience, you know, and comes around once a year to do the crisis management exercises and things. It's really looking at how you change the way you do everything, how you approach it and how you look at what your organization is going to be doing a lot further down the line. Um, I think it's very, very timely. Um, a lot of us during COVID had to do the pandemic responses. We reached for our BC plans, we reached for crisis management plans, um, and we responded accordingly, um, often to the immediate need and to the immediate resumption of services, which was completely right to do, um, and focusing in on the important services. But hopefully this um, particular code of practice helps us to look longer term so as we were all in the midst of that crisis, you know, what were we doing to look at um, two years hence? How was business going to change? How was the economy going to change? How was the demand of customers going to change? And could we proactively change our business and look at the resilience of it in the longer term? So I think it helps in that kind of um, way of looking at what your operating model is and what it could be. Mm -hmm. Just a quick follow up. Do you think that there's... Um any need for uh, something to certification? Do you think, you know, when you say people pick it up, would that be helpful to have certification around the, this particular, this is a code of practice, it's not a requirement or a specification. Do you think there might've been a need? Um, I think it would be good if there was um, an, an appreciation of having it as a requirement. Um, I don't know if there are certain industries that it would fit better with in making it a requirement. Some of them may adopt it. You'll often see some of the critical infrastructure firms or the financial services firms adopting ISOs um, and ensuring that they are compliant with it, um, if not just aligned to it. Um, I think that there is an increasing look at different industries. Um, you know, we were talking the other day about um, other people on this call working on the energy um, and infrastructure um, ISOs and, and the plans for those. And those other industries are starting to adopt um, a, a sort of requirements based practice. Um, so you've got the regulations that came out for the FinServs. You've even got other firms that are looking at it from the insurance world, from the energy world and thinking, actually, that might be quite a good idea. Um, and it helps to give a lot of reassurance to customers and to stakeholders that you are doing the right thing, that you are taking it seriously. Um, so, yeah, it, it could be um, very useful, I think, to get that buy in at a very high level and um, that this is a necessity it's not just a, a nice to have mm, okay thanks pat there pat with uh different things to bring up but deborah uh deborah you know you're you're at the emergency planning college really focusing on the training and I, forgive me i so it's also resilience but you i always associate it with a lot of the business continuity uh things uh so it, it, in, in asking the question about what your gut reaction to the standard that, you know, obviously, hopefully you'll say yes, that's a great standard. But um, just as Kate did, why, why do you think, what are the good points, the bad points, the areas for a possibility? What, what's your gut reaction? But also about the training. You must be looking at it from a training angle because the BCM, you, maybe you in resilience, you already do quite a lot of training at the EPC. We do. We do as the college and our job, you know, is is very much to, to prepare people and build capability. But what, what I love about this standard primarily is the timing of it, Dave. Um, so many people listening, and, and we think we can all agree that at national level, I don't think resilience has ever had the focus on it as it does now following COVID and other emergencies and events that have happened in the world and globally. So for, for me, the timing of it um, is excellent in that there is already an increased focus on resilience and also the appetite from leaders of organisations um, not just um, being able to respond and recover, but actually actually to innovate, to adapt. I think resilience is much more widely accepted and spoken about. So it's excellent timing for the standard to come out and incredibly relevant because as, um, as we're all aware that there is quite a lot of heavy criticism 
and scrutiny around the, the country's response to COVID and also individual organisations um, and, how, and how they basically coped, survived or not. Um, and whether they innovated during COVID, for example, you saw companies making defibrillators and hand sanitizer when that but wasn't their usual business operations. I don't know if they called it being resilient, but it certainly was them being resilient. So what I love about this stand is it actually kind of defines what a resilient organization needs to do and what, um, with the maturity model at the back of this standard, which is incredibly useful for organizations, because when we're trying to teach people how to build their resilience capabilities, not just as individuals in organizations, but in teams, um, and organisationally, the questions are, well, how do we do that? What do we need to do? Um, aren't we already doing that if we've got business continuity or we do crisis management or we've, we've got plans that should be enough? But this standard really takes it to a whole different level and, and is talking about the, the structures of the organisation and, and the objectives of an organisation all being aligned to the idea of resilience well before a crisis hits. So actually getting a lot better and um, not just good plans and good response, but actually getting better at anticipating what might happen and actually making and taking action to prevent that and hopefully reducing the impact on your organization. So that longer term planning. Um, and one more point and so I'll come back to, to Rick or I'll allow Rick, Dave to come back to Rick. For me, um, the best bit of this standard is the learning culture aspect. So obviously as a college, we're interested in that, but. One of the key things I like about this as a takeaway is it, the importance on organization um, learning from other mistakes, from their own mistakes, from uh, situations where they've had to adapt and they may or may not have made the right decision. So for, for me, that learning culture part where you really do uh, are encouraged to look at, have some foresight and then have some insight. But the best bit for me is the hindsight. So what could, what did we do? Did it work? What could we do better next time and how do we make sure that the impact of any disruption is reduced next time? Dave, Rick's hands up. I don't know if you can see yeah, so I was, for Rick to, to Oh, I was, yeah, I was, I, was, I was going to come in as well. I think, you know, and thanks, uh, Deborah and Kate, as well, for your, your, your glowing commentary on the standard. Um, it's really good to hear that. And uh, I... I think I just wanted to pull out as well, you know, because I often get asked and Deborah, you refer to, you know, business continuity and things there, you know, what's what's really the difference here? It, there are a lot of similarities, right, in terms of what business continuity set out to try and do and what this code of practice is setting out to try and do. But I think fundamentally the, the two or three things I'd pull out. One is it's trying to look at this in a very strategic way for an organisation. So it's not really a bottom up approach. It's very much a top down approach approach that's been highlighted through this and secondly it's really saying we should focus on the resilience of outcomes so in other words the things that you provide as an organization to your customers or to society more widely we should look at that and understand what is really essential to them and understand how we can make that outcome more resilient so that may not always involve necessarily recovery it it means looking at alternate ways perhaps of providing that looking at whether there's actually easy substitution within the market for example all of those things form a part of the overall picture of resilience uh, and i think that's a big change in the way we're trying to get organizations to think about uh, about resilience here the pause is intentional for other panelists to jump in as you please I'm frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm gobsmacked that Breer hasn't said anything about the, the strategic level, the learning, the stress testing. This is all your crisis management. You're doing best behavior today, Kev. <laughs> well, I, was, I was listening and learning and, and in all, but, no, but, but to be honest, um, so I helped write 65,000 in the first iteration and I, and I assisted um, quite quietly actually in, in this iteration. So it has been lovely to see how the standard has evolved over the years. And as the thinking of organizational resilience has evolved, so, so the standard has, has evolved in parallel to that thinking. And that's been very gratifying because when, when the, the first version was written back in 2014, we, we struggled around what resilience meant as a concept and actually how one translated the concept into reality. And I think um, to answer the point around whether it can be a requirement standard, um, I think that 
as resilience is a strategic objective for an organization and building resilience should be a strategic objective, how one could translate that into a requirement and evidence that in an empirical way could be a challenge. Um, people can say great words and people can write lovely policy, but actually by building resilience, it needs proactive effort and actually how one validates that that proactive effort is taking place effectively could be really challenging. And I think the, the evolution into the code of practice is very, very important. And, and I think people need to understand that the code of practice is only possible now because we have organizations that are able to, to point to, to what they have done to make themselves more resilient. And when we wrote the standard back in 2014, there weren't really many organizations that had defined resilience practices and processes, whereas now there is a, a wealth of empirical evidence that we can point to. So we can actually point to organizations saying, these guys are doing quite well, we can learn from them. And I think that's really, really important. Uh -huh. And to, to the point about learning and, and understanding, um, I did dabble with my PhD in how organizations learn from crises and risk management failures. And actually, as a result of my research, and I ran away after my major review and, and went did something else more exciting instead. But actually what I did learn was that it's the, the way organizations learn is through sharing knowledge and information and the standards process is probably the most effective vehicle for sharing that knowledge and understanding. So I think the, the actual standards process itself resort, re, supports the development of resilience. And I've seen the questions before I should be quiet. I've seen yeah. the questions from yeah, David. Don't give away any other surprises we've got in store for everyone. No, no, later. no, I was about to say we like have- Christmas. Up, yeah, well, no, we've picked up a couple of questions and to answer David Smith, um, don't, don't, don't answer David Smith will be well, no, night. No, he's asked a good question. So, and, and he's asked it about 37,000 blessing and he knows my passion in life. So, so actually in, in the latest version of 65,000, the importance of governance and the inextricable linkages has been specifically called out and along with the piece around risk management. So there's very, very clear linkages with those two ISO standards. And then to, to answer Adrian's question about internal aspects and external aspects, I think Rick made the point about no organization is an island, but I have used the I have used and I had heard use the term the risk archipelago and resilience archipelago, where organizations are all inextricably linked under the waterline. And so when you're looking at your organization, you have to understand your linkages and dependencies. And so resilience can never be insular. It must always take in that, that wider picture. Um, but I think that's enough. Yeah, from the, the, um, the code, thanks Kevin. Yeah, and the code of practice absolutely addresses that and, and sets out very clearly this sort of, what I term there is the whole of system approach. So, you know, for an organization to be resilient, it needs its partners and, and suppliers to be resilient, but it also needs the sector or the system within which it operates to be resilient. So that's a key key element. You know, you, you can't be organizationally resilient if the sector you're operating in is not resilient because that can lead to your downfall as well. This is what we saw in the financial crisis when we had a perpetual knock-on effect across multiple banks of one failure. Okay, so very much playing to that. I think it's important mm -hmm. also to identify how we've moved on from uh, sort of 2006 era with uh, the sort of British standard that was created then. But if you look back into the history and see where we've developed this journey towards uh, resilience and also the crisis management, we've moved from the 1970s, which was IT disaster recovery mentality within American bank institutions. In the, in the 70s and the 80s, we started to see regulation form. In the 90s, we saw things like the Business Continuity Institute form, and that created a more broadened set of values propositions around people and uh, the organization and its partners and so on. And now we've moved naturally as we leaped past some of the initial standards that were developed from British standards into this whole of nation or whole of system approach. And so we're moving in the right direction as society has become more connected together. We've got this hyper relationships between different parts of systems. 
which means that there's terminal risk in some areas because there are multiple casualties in a single event that can occur. And I mean, when I mean casualties, I don't just mean uh, people. I'm talking about uh, the impacts on industries and so on. Just look at what the Ukraine war has done. So we've moved this in this direction, and this is what this standard's moving us towards, and the crisis management standard is towards a more whole of system approach. It's never, ever easy to try and anticipate and understand all the moving pieces on the global field, especially as an, an organization moving through that space. But it's really important to at least put us in that position where we're starting to think ahead. Anticipation, and assessment are really, really important. And what I really like about this standard is in section 5.32, we have a section on anticipation because so many organizations are caught off guard simply by not being able to read the weak signals that are coming through either internally within their own organization of vulnerability accumulating or externally within the systems that they're operating. That's me out. Uh, Deborah first and Kate, please. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat I just thought I would address, Dave, which is um, from Adrian Miller asking about whether organisations use this as an internal activity and then to what extent do they use it externally? So clearly this has only just published this new standard, um, but in my experience generally with this standard, the, the previous version and other related standards in continuity and, and resilience risk, you might have um, your um, crisis management, previous iterations, they're, they're very much used internally um, for assurance to satisfy regulators potentially, um, and also just operationally, if you're lucky enough to have an organization that, that embraces standards from, not just from BSI, but industry standards generally. One example I've got without naming an organization is that they're part of a very wide critical sector, and they do tend to work together as sectors to build resilience. We've recently published a Lessons Digest um, publication looking at the lessons learned from Storm Arwen, for example. So what you can see is there is collaboration amongst organisations to learn lessons collectively from incidents like that storm, where you would see the energy sector coming together to figure out how can we be more resilient as a sector rather than just individual organisations. So just really going back to what Wayne and um, Kev are saying, it is that much more strategic whole of society approach to resilience that we we know the government is keen to support with a with an upcoming national resilience strategy due to be published and a new resilience directorate there's, there's that recognition that we need to um, work better and work in better ways across sectors and across society thanks dave i think there's the um the sort of working better across sectors and society and i completely agree on that and then there's working better internally as well um, there's a tendency to kind of see these standards as relating to one particular area, so business continuity standard or a crisis management standard. Um, and we've had questions here about you know, how does it relate to other ones that they're not sort of used in isolation or they're not done in isolation or checked off against you know, whatever is going on in the risk department or done by the risk teams feeds into resilience. You, know, you learn about the risk and the issues around the business. You remediate accordingly to try and make sure that you're more resilient for the future. If you're looking at vendor third party management or supply chain risks, you, you, you're reliant on that team, that supply chain management team to do their job properly and to adhere to their standards um, so that you then feed through um, that information back to your business continuity team and you develop strategies um, to deal with any vendor outages. So it's all very interconnected. And I don't think any of these um, so standards can necessarily be treated in isolation or used in isolation. You know, they're not um, a case of using one particular standard over another. Um, but this one in particular can offer you a lot of guidance on how you can build the, um, the company the way that it, it should be done to be most resilient for the future and where you can draw in um, the benefits of the other departments. So if you are doing a lot of the monitoring, for example, that's called out a lot in this sort of stress testing, it, it really encourages that cross collaboration, that breakdown of silos. And I know that we hear that a lot, breakdown of silos, but this one in particular, I think, um, calls for that. It calls for interaction between those different departments um, if you have a hope of being resilient as a firm. Kev, over to you, I think. Thank you, Kate. If, if I can just sort of support that position and, and echo it. 
I found over the years that when I've tried to to explain what resilience means to an organization, how they should perhaps mentally picture it. I've always used the metaphor that if one thinks about a brick wall and each of the bricks being the various protective aspects that one has in an organization, such as health and safety, risk management, change management, whatever the bricks uh, are labeled, the resilience is the mortar that binds these various areas together, makes sure that there's no gaps between the bricks and gives the, the the overall protective structure its shape, form, and stability and strength, and that and that uh, the resilience piece is that strategic objective about how you link all those areas together. And and sometimes one can't break down the silos, although one should endeavour to do so. But it's actually making sure that the linkages are there, so at least the communication piece and the the support piece works between between the various areas. Thank you. And I just, David Smith, I, um, I, I hope I've woken you up, David. I, I saw you, uh, you're doing a lot of work about this bringing together, joining things together. David Smith is the chair of G1 on governance. And he asked the question about how uh, this standard 65,000 relates to 37,000 in governance and 31,000 on risk management. He's a huge advocate of sort of these, call it integrated, management systems or just joined up thinking and i, I know he's, he's a real uh, champion dave i don't know are you able to um i i think you can speak if you want um I, i'm not sure if the uh if the audio permits you to do that but i, I thought you could but it would have been an interesting if you can but i was told you could uh, the attendees could actually not only type in their answer but they could speak but um, anyway for for the benefit of the panelists nothing else David Smith is chair of G1. He's very, very keen to work with the risk management groups, the continuity groups, the resilience, the ICT. He wants to talk together and see how we can bring all this together. This standard probably would be um, a nice uh, starting point or at least an important part of that discussion on integration. So listen, I've got um, a number of questions here. Can I just check with the panel? So there's um, there's a couple of comments. Have we answered everything in the, in the Q&A that uh, needs to be answered? Um we, we have to pick up the questions from Sarah at the end there, Dave. Uh, okay. You want me to do that now, Dave? Um, either, you know, frankly, I'm just, thank you, Wayne. I'll, I'll almost say yes. I'm conscious that Rick's going to leave us, or has he already left us? No, no I'm, I'm still here. Another okay. 10 minutes. Dave. Yeah. Okay, lovely. So can I can I give Rick a, a chance before you do that? Maybe, Rick, if you can weigh in here, you, given you've got 10 minutes left and the rest of us have got a little bit more than that. You got anything to add or you want to point out in terms of the questions? Or? I think uh, uh, one thing I, I, I can flag, and it, I think um, I'm okay to advertise this, Dave, as it's a BSI publication, sure. but uh, on your site, the, there is um, an executive brief, which you can download from BSI, it's on, on the BSI website, um, and the executive brief covers, again, some of the content, some of the things I've talked about uh, about the code of practice but if you know if you if you want to read more about the code of practice before you you dip into it itself then then i would definitely point you towards the executive brief uh, and it gives some very good examples in there as well uh, of how to apply the practices okay, so that executive brief is actually really really good i don't say that about everything so i'm not just saying that but but it really complements sixty five thousand really really well so um can somebody put that in the chat? Can we do that? How we do that? Is there, is there a chat there? Can, Rick, can you do that? Can you find a link and stick it in the chat, please, so people can have access? I, I, I will try and find a link, Dave, and see if I can. Thank you, the chat. Rick. Yep. Thank you, because it, it really is a very good executive brief, free, freely downloadable, complements sixty-five thousand really well. Okay, Wayne. Over yeah, thanks, Dave. So Sarah's asked a question about QHSE and how it relates this standard to uh, to that sort of area. Well, um, principally, if you look at uh, I don't know if it's still on the screen or not, but the slide is on my screen and uh, it identifies the sort of guiding principles so foresight, insight, hindsight and uh, oversight, for example, would be really important. A lot of uh, QHSE targets that they get to zero uh, sort of uh, injuries or events. And so uh, those sort of areas, particularly within the cultural domain, are really important. In addition to that, I'd say that the five capitals could play a role in this because you're measuring and supporting the safety environments within the sort of physical infrastructure, but also uh, trying to get social messages across and so on. So I'd say that the potential to map 
a lot of these uh, messages that are important in the QHSE fit within those domains for a start. I'm used to working within the petrochemical oil and gas industry, so critical infrastructure and uh, particularly high risk infrastructure environments. And I know there's always the need for a message that runs across the entire organization in terms of pre prevention and protection of personnel. Uh, dealt with lots and lots of incidents with gas explosions and all sorts of things uh, where people have been killed. So as a result, I think it really is uh, part and parcel and extension of that and you can use organizational resilience with whatever your targets are at QHSE uh, within your organization, whatever that QHSE environment is. I've just used oil and gas as, as an example um, to, to really to tighten the message and to send that as part of a sort of compact of messages that are going forward about protection of the organization. What we do know is that uh, when there are lots of casualties involved in a dramatic incident like the uh, the oil and gas environment we know that there's very often uh, a quick uh, public reaction to blame uh, the organization i mean there's not really that much love really for the oil and gas industry these days particularly as we see sustainability come forward so if organizations want to hedge their their sort of uh, media communications potentially uh, potentially in a sort of anti-oil and gas environment definitely but I don't know what industry you're working in, Sarah, but there's just some thoughts. Wayne, thanks for that. Hey, I got to give you a quick plug. Wayne, uh, when he talks about large numbers of casualties, he's uh, embarking on something at European level on global catastrophic risk. Mm -hmm. So that's all the time we have for, for that. But um, it, it's a very, very large. What is it, 20 million plus sort of meteor collisions and um, you know, plagues and what what's Wayne, just they, they, 10, second, 10 seconds then Go, so, 10 seconds. basically i'm working with defra who's also looking at global catastrophic risks uh, across spectrums many spectrums including new technologies that are nascent that could destroy societies and humanity um and uh, the one of the working definitions that we have it's not set in stone is 10 trillion in damage 10 trillion uh, pounds in damage and uh and 10 million or more uh, people killed in a single incident. Okay. That's well, event. if you want to get anybody wants to get involved in that uh, that work that Wayne's talking about, he's a chair of societal security uh, management. So SSM one, that's the BSI committee to reference. And uh, thank you, Wayne. Actually, it's a kind of a nice lead into uh, Kev. Kev yeah, Dave, Kev. just before you do, just to let oh. you know and all, all participants know, if you go to the chat, I have posted the link where you can get the executive brief. Thanks. Thanks. I hope everybody has access. Somebody else, I think it was the uh, lemon zest, uh, whether it was Dave or James, I think he indicated that for Sarah or something, we'll have access to these things afterwards, but there it is. Uh, thank yeah. you. Okay, lovely. Kev, you all set to go on for your overview of uh, crisis? Yeah, please? I think so. Thank you, Dave. So, so we're now going to talk about um, BSEN ISO 22361, which uh, I think publishes in the UK on the 30th of November, but is available to, to order now from the BSI website. And I think the ISO version has already been published. Um, it takes us a bit longer to put our badging on it and, and make sure that, that uh, it's fit for purpose. So, um, <clears throat> right, so let's talk a bit about 22361. 22361 is the first international standard on crisis management. Um, there have been a number of other standards that talk about crisis management as, as a sort of a, a bolt on or an additional thought. But this is the first time that there's been a standard that's been dedicated to the subject of crisis management. Um, there is a history to it, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Let's first talk about the definition of crisis. And this is probably the, the most useful thing that, that we can talk about today, because actually this is the first consensus driven international understanding of crisis that, that we've um, pulled together and and it's there in front of you i won't read it out to you per se but the one thing i would say is actually the notes underneath it are very important and the notes add the 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 color to that picture and so so when one looks at that definition one needs to understand that that actually we're talking about those events that that can basically 
cause existential challenges, um, damage reputation, cause strategic level challenges for an organization. And some commentary has already been made about the difference between business continuity and, and disruptions and things like that. And one has to bear in mind there's a there's a hierarchy to these sort of events. If one has a, a business disruption and one uses the business continuity plans, to Rick's point that he made earlier, if those business continuity plans do not function, there's no point trying to use more business continuity plans. One has to rethink one's approach, one has to rethink one's objectives, and one has to come up with a better and alternative strategy. And so, and so that's the premise upon which the, the standard um, was written from. Um, one of the things that, that's really challenging around a crisis is that people use the term interchangeably with other terms they don't really think about how that term differs or or how it's applicable but the 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 biggest challenge we had as a panel when developing this definition was actually the same event or situation can have different impacts upon different people in the in the, the situation and the example that we used to use as the working example was the the factory fire and in the case of a factory fire, the, the fire itself would be an incident for the local emergency services because they would be trained and equipped to deal with the situation. And that for them would be an incident. It's perfectly within their capacity and capabilities and, and they would deal with it. For the, the factory owners themselves, if their business continuity plans were not up to date and they were not able to to continue operation at another site, that for them would be a crisis because it would be an existential challenge and they could not generate any income. And for possibly for the local community, depending on the impact of the fire upon their lives and the pollution it caused and all those things, again, it could be a, a crisis. But for the, the competitors, to the factory owners and to the business, for them, the same situation could could generate a business opportunity and they could increase sales and market revenue on the back of the, the, the catastrophe or the, the crisis that the business found itself in. So, so when you look at the, the situation and look at it through those different lenses, then that actually becomes very complex as to what a crisis is. And that bit around exceeding capacity or capability is really important. Because when I spoke about the emergency services, when they, arose, when they arrived to, to deal with the situation, if they found that they didn't have adequate capabilities, they didn't have adequate capacity, that would overwhelm those capabilities and capacity. And that for them would be a crisis. They'd have to think outside the box. They'd have to come up with these better, better solutions, alternative solutions, or, or seek support from elsewhere. And, and moving then on to, to the overview, the, the 22361 overview was built on a principles-based system. And so it works with both management and non-management system standards, but also we understood that organizations have different command and control structures. The command and control structures used in North America, the Middle East, other parts of the world are not the same command and control structures as used in Western Europe and Australia, for example. So we try to make it principles based so that actually whatever your command and control structure was, it, the principles would still be applicable. Um, those seven principles we'll talk about on the next slide, but the principles are underpinned by skills, competencies, process and assets and knowledge, a framework. And all of those elements together build the capabilities. And this is quite a radical approach in 22361 because we're not just talking about repeatable processes and structures. We're actually talking about building human understanding, capability, and competency. And, and that's a, a really important bit that's needed to be understood. The actual knowledge, understanding, mental capacity to deal with the challenges is really, really important. And organizations need to develop those skills and, and understandings. If we can move on to the, to the, the seven principles. The next slide, please, Dave. Thank you. Um, following on from, from David Smith's comment earlier, governance is a, is a key part of the, 
the principles, as is the strategic aspect. This is a strategic process we're talking about, but also fitting in the, the risk management understanding and contextualizing the activities. And then on those softer, those softer um, skills, the decision making, the communication, the ethics, the learning, those are all human aspects that need to be thought about and actually thought about how as an organization one can develop those skills. And there is a section in the standard that talks about leadership as a specific skill. Many people get promoted to high office in organizations through the excellent work that they do uh, in business as usual situations. That does not mean that because someone has reached high office that they are immediately equipped to be a, a good leader in a crisis and actually part of the, the, the challenge in developing the crisis management team and the leadership structure is actually finding those people that are able to cope with leadership and understand there's a difference between management and leadership and how those qualities are, are translated. And if we can go on, Dave, to the next slide, please, which gives the overview of the complete picture. So there we have all of the principles, the framework and the, the elements that come together to, to build those capabilities and those capacities. And right at the center of all of this is the concept of continual improvement. Because no matter how good you think you may be, the organization will change in terms of membership, leadership, and, and environment that it operates in. And so you always need to make sure that you reflect upon your arrangements, you reflect upon what you're doing, and you, you seek to improve and get better at it. And, and one doesn't become hubristic and rest on one's laurels. And then last but not least, thank you, Dave, is the relationship between issues, incidents, and crises. We spoke earlier about the, the difference in the, the, the definition, but actually, if one thinks about issues, they happen on a frequent basis in an organization. Most of those issues will be resolved satisfactorily. Some will develop into incidents that, that generate operational challenges that then have to be addressed. And then those, those incidents can develop into to crises if they're not managed appropriately. And for those of you that are aware with Swiss, Reason Swiss Cheese model, how bits can drop through the control structures and go straight into a crisis needs to be borne in mind. And then obviously a crisis can develop in, or can, can spawn further incidents and, 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 and issues. So there is that inextricable relationship. The key part for an organization is actually understanding what's in front of them and having the foresight to understand that the situation can develop and become a problem and more importantly choosing the the right time to escalate and that's enough for me um i think wayne can can add some thoughts as well as he was a, a key player as we helped develop the standards thank you thanks kevin david are we free to speak go cool. sounds good yeah thank you kev that was great okay so uh, Kevin's touched on some really uh, useful points there in terms of standard. It was a pleasure to be part of this standard. And Kevin, you did an excellent job uh, running the, uh, the show as the chair for all of this, the convener. Um, so working around the world, there's different capacities that exist. So I've just come back from working with 10 nations in the Asia region. And um, some of the aspirational goals that are contained both within the standard that Rick's presented and also the work that Kevin's just presented here um, it's aspirational, uh, disaster risk reduction. So we need to remember that we're not trying to write a standard which is um, which is the best in class for everything because not everybody can reach the best in class for everything. We're trying to develop something which is a sort of normative process, something where people are able to achieve it. And so we're not talking about best practice here. We're talking about what's defined as good practice and what's commonly used. And so it's really important that as we look at capacity building for one half of the one half of the world out there, that some of the targets in these are aspirational. And so working with organizations uh, like uh, Bangladesh and Indonesia and so on is, is, is really interesting to see how they look at things through the prism of Sendai framework and the Asian agreement on disaster risk, uh, disaster management and so on. 
Um, and so they won't always have the capacity or, as Kevin said, the infrastructure to be able to deal. But that doesn't mean to say that they're not apt at being able to deal with their situations. So this is, first of all, just a plug to say that there is more than just the West's perspective in this. It allows this modulation for different types of uh, capabilities and different types of capacity building to exist. The other point I'll say is that... Um, that Kevin talked about command and control systems around the world, and that's so true. In some parts of the world, we don't even refer to things as crises. It's got a different genera, a different name or lexicon. Um, C5I is a concept, for example, that's out there, command and control, that's C2, command and control, the old model, communications, computing, cyber defense, and then information. So building that capability, depending on what your organization faces on its threat frontiers, on its spectrum, uh, which is really important. And then finally, it's really good to see ethics mentioned in there. I was a big advocate pushing for the ethics stuff because very often we think crises happen to organizations, but in reality, many organizations manufacture their own crises, sometimes not with intent, but individuals in them do things that are nefarious or wrong. So, for example, ethical misconduct disasters. There's plenty of those. Enron, WorldCom, Martha Stewart, Dynegy, I'm Clone Systems. They all exist and they're having profound impact in failures, but we don't often exercise or test for the fact that we've got people that are bad apples within our organization that bring it into dis disrepute, potentially bring it down the Bearings Bank situation, and it's not very easy to get a uh, exercise signed off where the whole governance structure, as in uh, Enron, are, are corrupt, and they're not going to sign off on an exercise that reflects that, and there are organisations, unfortunately, that are in that position right now. That's me out. Hey, ladies. Deborah first, and Kate. Hit it. Hi there. No, it was really fascinating because I'm, I'm having having read the standard and, and been involved in BS 11200 in, in the old days. It's really good to see all of those additional aspects brought in. I'm curious to hear from, from Kev and uh, Wayne about what they think about the new word added to the dictionary this year, a permacrisis, because we talk about crisis as an abnormal or extraordinary event in this standard, but actually we're more and more hearing that people feel and organisations feel they're in permanent crisis at the moment. So how do you think this standard can help those organisations that think they're in permanent crisis? Would you agree with that or not as a word? It's an interesting concept. Wait, hold on just one second before you go launch into that oh, one. Kate, Kate yeah. did you have anything that that's a, that's a big topic? Kate, did you have anything a little? Not, not related to that one. So if we go to Kevin Wayne first, and then I'll come back to me. Okay, you're happy. Okay, fine. Go ahead, oh, Kevin. Sorry, you're Kevin, thank you. Um, yeah, I I kind of I, I kind of struggle with with perma crisis, and I and if I'm brutally honest, when Lagadec published his paper in 2009 when he spoke about mega crises i struggled with that as well because because actually applying a scale to a crisis is is difficult but actually when one thinks about crisis management one of the the primary objectives in the situation is to try and stabilize the the situation one's in and stop it deteriorating before one can actually move forward and, and resolve it so i think in terms of in terms of actually the, the, the concept, this is a whole number of challenges. The actual fundamentals of how one needs to address these challenges doesn't change. One still has to identify the objectives, identify the routes to achieving those objectives, and then working towards them to get there. So the fact that something comes in from left field that then that detracts from that is part of the, the process of re-evaluating the situation, understanding how the, the situation has evolved, and then and then adapting one's response uh, processes and, and, and activities accordingly. So, so I think it's an interesting concept. I do I do think that as a world. We're, we're sort of struggling with all of the various things. Climate change is, is most definitely upon us. The impacts of that are, are, are becoming very apparent and becoming some really, well, it's creating some, some horrific consequences if, if one looks at Australia and Pakistan and other such nations around the world that have suffered some of the brunt of these things. And so, 
So okay, actually, we well, you know, to... Kev, I'm conscious of time. We got about ten minutes left. So do feel free to elaborate, Wayne. I, I don't even know if you need to add anything to that or. Oh, okay. Just a couple of things, you know, there's a huge amount of challenges in the world right now that will touch all of us, food security, energy security, water security, migration that's been mismanaged, um, border security, all sorts of issues are going on at the moment. And so what we're getting is overwhelmed by so many different parts of uh, brewing crises, and they are coming to a front, the climate crisis for example we've got new frontiers on technology in the fourth industrial revolution which are going to open paradigms and if i could just tell you one quick thing then i'll pause there that is for example artificial intelligence so i look at lots and lots of new nascent technologies what i've spent the past five years doing everything from biomimicry right through to um, blockchain to cyber to you name it and um, just one AI system that was learning the uh, a couple of weeks ago identified and made a recipe for 40,000 different weapons of mass destruction in, uh, in six hours. And that was in a controlled environment. So you start to think about what the impact of all of these nascent technologies, which some are going to be used for good, but the potential to reverse engineer biotech for something that's 100 times worse than COVID, and uh, you get a little goldfinger person out there that wants to do that, and suddenly you've got a big problem in the world. So this area of crisis management is so, 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 so important because we're going to hit a frontier, which is going to reshape everything that we think we know around blockchain, smart contracts, all sorts of things in the future. And the business we're going to be doing in the next five to 10 years is going to be completely different. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Kate, please. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think it's going to change um, and evolve as time goes on. And the, the speed with which we're required to react is ever increasing. And the skill with which we're required to react is, is increasing too. And someone commented um, in the chat about the, the skills that we're trying to um, sort of teach or, or encourage um, in junior staff and how they can evolve um, over time. And it's it's almost by jumping in at the deep end at the moment. You know, there are compounding crises. There are one after the other. Um, but I thought it was interesting what Kev was saying about trying to stop the crisis before it happens. And at the moment, a real challenge for us is that there are often external crises. You know, you've got pandemics or wars or floods or hurricanes or, you know, we can't possibly stop those. So it's very much um, sort of trying to use this particular ISO to try and embed that crisis management aspect um, and that crisis response side, but it links in very, very nicely with the organizational resilience aspect, actually, and trying to embed the culture that has a response to the crisis that you can stop, um, the ones that you can try and mitigate in advance. And that's sort of where that link is. So if you've got things internally that you're reliant upon, um, it, it's building that resilience in, in ahead of time. Um, so we talk at the moment about vendor resilience, about supply chain resilience, about um, energy resilience, about personnel resilience. You know, the, the list is becoming endless. And actually, it's building resilience into those fields as business as usual, so that when the incidents come up, that they can preemptively try and stop them, I think. And that when there are crises that are externally hitting companies, that they can um, have a culture that is built off the back of ISO such as this one that enable them to respond very quickly. And those skills that they need for um, crisis management, I think are often very underrated and undervalued until the time hits um, and aren't necessarily looked at in advance. So this one in particular is incredibly helpful in looking at things like leadership, like the ethics side, like the communications, that until it hits, it is a very different skill set and it's not necessarily realized. Thanks, Kate. Those, those are some interesting points I'm, I'm conscious that uh, the people who are attending i think uh, sue you were the one who raised the question about um the that uh, kate just referred to uh panelists can you have a look at that from sue bolton i don't know if we've answered that you touched on it there i don't know if you fully answered it panelists i, I yeah. don't think f fully answered i'm not sure that we can solve the analytical <laughs> skills side um but if you do want sort of education on crisis management i think deborah's the one to talk to this um, a lovely lead in because the one question i had for deborah was at the epc which i gotta give you guys a plug at the hawk hills <laughs> fantastic location 
uh, you know, you, you hosted the, the launch for 65,000. So thank you for that with BSI. And that's in, on, uh, just above New York there. But uh, you're doing training for these areas, resilience, crisis, uh, continuity. Do, do you think BSI is producing the right standards to give you enough to, to do up there in, in the Hawk Hills? I mean, or would you would you like to see other other areas? And a little bit tongue in cheek there, but you know, how do you find the portfolio of standards? I know other organizations are producing their 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 uh, their protocols and their training manuals and whatnot too. But from BSI standard, how do you think BSI is doing? The committee Car One, which frankly you're going to be chair of, so you'll have an influence of it soon enough. But you're talking to other committee members. How do you think we're doing in producing standards that, that are needed for for you know whatever you say UK PLC or the market? And you know how, how yeah. how's it going there in the EPC? You think okay. everything's going swimmingly well? <laughs> no, I, I would love to say yes. Um, but from our perspectives as the college, because of the um, rapid change and because of the recent global crisis, I feel like our work is is still to do. And, and if we sat here and said there isn't work to do and sit back and think everything's rosy, it's not. We ourselves apply the concept of continual improvement, like Kev mentioned, and being a resilient organisation really uh, to ourselves. And we need to be resilient ourselves in response and, and, and all of the responded public sector organisations from a national to local level are really seizing this opportunity to learn lessons and to really collaborate more with each other and standards like the crisis management standard and, and the resilience standard, as well as the continuity and all those related standards are incredibly helpful and tools to help us have a common language, a common understanding. And in particular, Dave, what, what is constantly being sought and is aspirational is, is how am I doing? How am I doing as an organization? How am I doing as an individual? What skills do I need? to what level and how do I know when I've got there and if I've done a good job so part of our job at the college is working not just with responder organizations but um, other organizations is to figure this out there is there is a lack of um, training and learning pathways in resilience and to have that core skill set that they're quite old and there's been several attempts to have that sort of national competency framework for doing resilience for doing crisis and I know it's something that government is focused on at the moment is looking at that um, learning and competencies and skills requirement because it is one of the things that gets that gets scrutinized is how do you know if you've done something well and how do you know what the, the standard is and, it, and the maturity model for example in 65,000 is, is excellent in that you know there is a collective consensus of what good practice looks like and I think that's incredibly helpful when it comes to to referring to standards from the BSI and also industry sector standards as well um, and specific standards for local resilience forums for example is making sure that they are constantly updated with lessons and I think that's really important is if we just don't ever change them and, and, and just don't adapt those, then we're not being resilient ourselves. So for me, it's about making sure that we are sharing the information and the good practice, like Kev said, which is good practice in crisis and incident management, but also in that continual improvement. So I would welcome a much broader approach, Dave, as I know BSI are doing to have more and more practitioners, more and more organizations and sectors represented in standards building so that you can constantly be drawing on what people have learned and what that good and leading practice looks like. That's the key for me is bringing those people together and sharing that information and knowledge through standards and other guidance that is incredibly important. Good. Listen, I, I gave you the last word there uh, because we do want to be punctual. There's other sessions to go on and whatnot. Thank you for that, Deborah. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Kev. Rick has left already, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I mentioned that the launch for 65,000 took place in September at uh, the Hawk Hills, the EPC. I should also mention that on the 24th of November, the crisis management standard, 22361, that is uh, going to be uh, officially launched at uh, PwC at Embankment. It's the 24th of November. It's free. It's a morning event. I think it's 10 to 1230 ish, something like that. And uh, you, you can sign up. I, I think there's there are places left, but there, there won't be um, in, uh, in the near future. So you got a couple of days to sign up for that event if you haven't already, if you're interested in that, that, that launch. So thank you, guys. Thanks, panelists. Thanks, attendees. Really appreciated the um, the lively, good, and you know, interesting discourse. Appreciate it. We're gonna have to sign up now. 
Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Right. Thank bye-bye. You. Bye-bye. 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 bye-bye.